afternoon, and welcome to Building Our Own Table, a symposium to honor the work of Lisa Williams. A uh, special thanks to all of you gathered here at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, which has been generous uh, um, in hosting and funding this event, and to those of you joining us uh, via Zoom. We are here to recognize, celebrate, show our appreciation to, or big up, the work of Lisa Williams. As everyone here knows, Lisa is the founder and director of the Edinburgh Caribbean Association. Uh, everyone, everyone should know Lisa from her popular and always fully booked Black History Walking Tours through Edinburgh's old and new towns. Lisa's extensive knowledge of Edinburgh's connection to the transatlantic slave trade and the lives of Black and mixed heritage Scots in this country from the 16th century up to today has meant that she has been an indispensable historian, an educator, and authority for many of the institutions in this city, particularly in their efforts in recent years to hold themselves accountable for past injustices. Others here in attendance might know Lisa from her tireless efforts with Edinburgh's primary and secondary students, working on school boards and educational assessments to determine how Scottish students across, how Scottish students um, across, uh, sorry, access black history in a way that doesn't strip away dignity or present it as a mere footnote to British history. Many of us have read her research pu publications for institutions like the National Galleries and the National Museum of Scotland, where she has introduced countless people to consider a revised and inclusive history of Scotland that acknowledges the wrongs done over the centuries to people of African descent while managing not to inflict trauma on their living descendants. Still others here uh, will be familiar with Lisa for her work as poet and writer. Um, just recently, her, her poem titled Crossed was included in the latest edition of Stand Magazine, a special issue featuring the poetry of African American, Black British, and Caribbean women, and women identifying writers. As a literary historian, I, I, I understand the ways in which Lisa uses poetry, and I think we can, we can kind of start to think about poetry and how it works to simultaneously witness and comment. And I think there might be a, a poem or two read by the end of the evening. Uh, on behalf of the three speakers who I will introduce shortly, Nadine, Katucha, and Chantel, who's joining us today on Zoom, I, I want to extend gratitude to Lisa for allowing us to spend these few hours celebrating all that she's done for us and for the city of Edinburgh. My name is Desha Osborne. I'm currently a fellow here at IASH. Uh, Lisa and I uh, kept having chance encounters back, uh, be be beginning rather, in 2019 when I was in Scotland on uh, another fellowship. Like many of you here, my work embeds Caribbean literature, history, and culture. My current project explores the migrations of Northeast Scot Scottish men to the ceded islands in the 18th century the enslaved and free women of African descent and their subsequent mixed heritage children. Lisa and I started turning up at the same events, lectures, poetry readings, book signings, and finally my own seminar where we realized these were more than just chance encounters. We kept in touch after my return to New York and, and I learned that the thing causing me so much anguish about my work, that is, what I mean here is how to write about the rights of enslaved women and Scottish men who incidentally included my own ancestors on both sides, how to do that with care, that impasse, that in involved uh, a particular type of witnessing. That was what Lisa had learned, had leaned into long ago and expertly used to effectively turn her engagement with history into the work of healing. I've used, I've, I've used her, hear this term, the birth of healing. Um, I've heard her use it many times in conversation 
over coffee, lunch. So much so that I had contemplating using that phrase, history as the work of healing, as an alternate title for this event. I went on Lisa's Black History walking tour six days ago with a group of fellows from IASH. Once again, I heard her use this, this phrase, that when, when telling the history of the lives of black people in Britain, we should think of and do history as the work of healing. This imperative is what in, in part motivates my current research project, the, the recuperation of the lives of the dispossessed. To enter the archive, a place that Sadia Hartman calls a mortuary, a place that dictates what can be said about the past and the kinds of stories that can be told, yet laboring to do the seemingly impossible, which is to paint as full a picture of the lives of the dispossessed. Sorry to interrupt, Esha, just one tiny thing. Um, if you can not lay your papers on the laptop itself, because it's causing a little bit of scratching on the microphone. Thank you very much. No problem. Lisa's tours and her writing, her tours and her writing and her poetry have found a way to speak into and through these mournful archival silences. If you haven't gone, uh, gone yet on her tour, I recommend signing up as soon as possible. This idea of history as the work of healing, indicating a very difficult and careful praxis, is found in a certain type of historical labor not just the struggle to be the first to say what happened, but the struggle to do uh, what, again, might seem to be the impossible. What does this praxis do, I think is an important question, and how is it scripted and performed for, for black scholars is at the heart of this roundtable discussion. For Lisa, like uh, so many black and brown women, women of color who engage with history, the difficulty has been with this delicate teasing, this pulling, this extracting of selves, and I, mean, I mean bodies with their flesh intact, out of these grand narratives of men, money, and its movements. What I mean to say is that, that Lisa teaches us that healing needs to be a form of critique. Her engagement with history as the work of healing has become a rubric, a way to create and test spaces that tell the story of black people in this country with dignity. Any person who has been on the Black History Walking Tour can hear, see, and feel that. Lisa did years of heritage work in the Grenadines, which is part of the island chain where my history originates, at, and Grenada. And I think that has prepared her for this position as historian and educator. By applying that rubric, she teaches all of us what it means to grapple with language, with the idea of lifelong learning as method, and as far as the archive goes, knowing where and when to stop. The search for a new vocabulary requires moving away from trauma as the groundwork for, black, for the Black experience. The work of Black archival practices is often spoke of using um, African-American historian John Hope Franklin's metaphor of, of weaving the black presence into, quote, the fabric of American history. So this brings us to the title of this talk, of this event, which is a different historiographical me metaphor um, that I think encapsulates my experience with Lisa as colleague and friend and the inspiration for this event. Her work has shown all of us, particularly those of us who, who are black and brown scholars, educators, students, and those of us who are in the activist um, outreach circles, that in order to, to tell the stories we want to tell, we need to build our own tables. Other people's tables just won't do. This means not waiting for a space at someone else's table, nor does it mean fighting others in your same predicament for a, split, for a place at a table with only one only with, with room for only one of you. Building our own table means selecting and creating the, the material in which to construct your stories. Building our own tables also means being prepared for hostility. It means being prepared to speak when we have been used to, when we have been used to being silenced and being ready to hear the sound of our own voices. I'm extremely grateful to the panel, Nadine, Katucha, and Chantel, 
uh, we'll, we'll each be speaking for a few minutes, about well, roughly 10 minutes each. Then we have a round of questions, and then we're going to open up the floor to the audience. After that, we have a short break, and then Lisa will speak. Um, but first, some, intro some introductions, um, and this is going to be in order. So the first person to speak is uh, Nadine. She is a PhD candidate. Sorry, Nadine Chambers. She is a PhD candidate at the University of London, Birkbeck, working on a transnational dissertation looking at Black and Indigenous relations from a Jamaican perspective by using legal geography, Indigenous and Black geographies with a feminist lens. She was raised in a West Indian Federation Pan-Africanist oriented family by a, li a librarian mother. Student and working class people's access to archives as well as the, the preservation and growth of Caribbean archives and small archives beyond digital technology as progress are the two big loves of hers. She's currently a, a, the senior student representative on the user advisory group for the, for the National Archives in the UK and has been a British Library Echoes Fellow for 2019 and 2020. So, Nadine. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I would like to um, open by thanking Daisha Fur and Ayash for supporting this event happening. Um, and the pleasure of being on a panel with other black women whose interests in archives, and by this I will say my definition of archives are both the material ones and the intangible ones that exist. Um, for me, uh, material archives uh, often are crossroads spaces um, where, as I like to say, the, the old ones, the dead, you know, will actually send you something. There is never an error. <laughs> there have been many times when uh, I've ordered a box and the wrong box comes, but it's never the wrong box. It usually means there's something in that box that either I need or somebody else I know is looking for. Uh, earlier today we were talking and I was talking about how much um, material there is that is uh, not correctly catalogued <laughs> and my mother was a cataloger. Um, my mother who I invoke um, uh, basically um, did a library science degree here in England, met my dad here um, and went back to the Caribbean and was part of uh, that beginning where our, our, our scholars, our students, were no longer going to the UK to study. We were able to build um, our own departments, uh, have our own students follow through BA to MA to PhD. And I lived with my mother in the back end of the university. Um, so for me, archives are always about the worker, libraries. Uh, I always know the names of the cleaners the security guards, um, and those people have actually been quite uh, crucial um, along my journey in terms of as, as I've traveled. Um, I wanted to start by saying uh, really thank you for this invitation and to let you know that each um, woman on the panel, um, Katusha, uh, Lisa, and Chantel, have actually played a part in how my persistence in traveling through the archive um, is maintained. Uh, Chantelle I'll open with, although she's not here, she's um, here via Zoom. Um, met, I met her in the National Archives. She was doing research many years ago on uh, Grenada. And in a moment of absolute generosity, she extended the, 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 the uh, the slave registry list that she was looking at. It's a moment where somebody is saying to you, you can be here too, sister. It's, it's absolutely quite critical because as we know, archival work can be very lonely. You just, you in your box, nobody really knows what's in that box. And I'm always grateful for that particular moment. Um, Katusha is part of uh, my journey here in Scotland. I had a wonderful find of uh, uh, the name of a, of a woman who is listed as a runaway. 
And I had gone through miles of archival material that day um, to find this name. Her name was Brilliant. And the joy for me was I happened to be having lunch with Katusha and to be able to celebrate finding this moment of resistance in the record. This woman I suspect knows never found, but by her name, it's kind of like her spirit name was out there in the open, in the record, you know? There was something about her that could not be denied. She was not a Betty or a Jane. Her name is listed as brilliant and she's a runaway. And the joy of like being able to celebrate that with you was uh, just really quite wonderful. So my project, uh, just to say why, um, beyond having grown up in the back of a repository at a university filled with black and brown people and it's entirely at all levels uh, and people supporting repositories, black and brown people as, as the leadership, uh, means the journey here to track our things uh, is quite interesting uh, in terms of how much material is here, how it is catalogued, um, and how, how the shape of the archive and the geography of the archive is, is an own story in itself in terms of how to do this research with honor. So I'll give you a little sense of what the research is that I'm doing um, because generously Desha is going to lead us with other questions. Um, but the research that I'm doing uh, is in a sense uh, tied to um, my father's side of the story. Um, when I was born, um, the first house I lived in was a company home, a mine uh, for a major giant um, alum uh, bauxite mining company, aluminium company called Alcan. Um, literally, I like to think or I refer to it as being born in the shadow of a mine. Uh, that mine uh, and that company, which I found in Fort William, by the way, and thanks to uh, my friend Eloise, who's helped make the connection with um, folks who are looking at that transnational link. It seems like a tiny hub. It's just a little smelter up in, you know, the highlands in Scotland, but it's actually tied through this transnational company it's with the same uh, metal that ties Jamaica to Canada um, and specifically to um, the Pacific Northwest where I've lived since 1991. Um, my archival research um, is how to explain it is to understand um, uh, the particular complexity of what it has meant to be um, a child of uh, folks who were formerly enslaved. My great grandmother lived to 110 she was uh, one of the first in her family born free. And um, so touching her and being on that land, like these histories are not unreal to me. 1882 is like the start of time for me. Do you know what I mean? It's a, it's, it's, it's a beginning where people are, it's this ancient. For me, I'm like, that's when my great grandmother is born. And she's one of the youngest. So the timeline extends. So. In terms of thinking through um, where I was born and where I ended up living, um, I came to understand that uh, Jamaican soil had been expropriated mined to make uh, be a part of, you know, this light metal aluminium. And that a smelter had been built specifically to, to smelt the ore in Kitimat in, in northern BC, where I lived. What it meant for me was that the project extended um, beyond kind of what it meant for people to have been, um, what, to look, what it meant to look through the record of where people had been, um, had been emancipated, had struggled to hold on to land, and then that land was literally ripped away from them for a corporation to design its particular profit um, goals. But then I had to realize that it went somewhere and tracking where it went and then the dispossession that had happened there with the building of the smelter, which the impact of that small location legally extended to over 4 million acres in terms of not just the building of the smelter, 
but the building of the power line and then the dam in order to power that smelter. Um, in Canada, which I know is a very romanticized space, um, you know, the, the absolute reality of indigenous life and land and uh, history and struggle in terms of colonization and another form of decolonization, um, separate from the ones that Lisa and I would talk about in terms of our connection around the West Indian Federation dream that we are both granddaughters of. It meant uh, a two-eyed way of having to see the record. How to write this in a way and look at the archive in a way that said that other people's uh, dispossession was intimately tied. Often these histories are spoken about quite separately and there's a reason for that. There's an absolute deliberate reason why blackness and indigeneity are are cast as separate things. And yeah, there are different processes, but it is quite often um, possible to see where the, there is a very direct line of connection. Um, it has meant, uh, and I'm very lucky to have supervision um, uh, with through legal geography, to literally see how this entire thing was set up. And it requires traveling through records. I've been very lucky um, I'll say corporate records are extremely difficult to track through. They're private. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the gifts of, of other uh, researchers gifting parts of the archive that they've been able to copy, especially when they're white scholars who've been able to get into private archives where immediately me knocking at the door would, would be a, a no has been quite clear and I, I want to thank Alyssa Trotz at U of T for allowing me access to one of those. Um, my project in terms of just seeing how the UK structured this um, is, is like it was part of how the structure of its dominions and then its old colonies is, is uh, quite uh, interesting and I'm hoping that the project is going to be important for thinking through alliance, especially between racialized folks. We see a lot of alliance work talked about where whiteness is centered in that regard, but there are other alliance work that actually needs to be done. And it begins for me as I want to wrap here with how I enter the archive and how I'm treated in archives. That's a really huge one. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap up here because we're going to have question and answer parts to speak to but i want to say that um one of the 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 most powerful moments that i had was entering an archive um where it was obvious that the uh archivist had absolutely no interest in helping me i spent hours digging through digging and asking questions and having absolutely no help I was there in the morning, darkness fell, and I was, as I was leaving, there was a, a shadow box display. So you leave the brightness of the library and go into a shadow display for you know, light boxes, etc., and then on and out. And a voice came from one of the, behind one of the shadow boxes, and it was a black security guard. And he said to me, you must come back here. Not enough of us come to this place. And there are many people I feel, uh, or many things I feel a sense of um, alliance to, but my alliance is often to that security guard who obviously risked his job to wait just to let me know that I needed to come back um, that he obviously knew there were treasures in there that were being shared with other people in terms of people talking very freely as they come and go. But he clearly knew that I had struggled in there. And so the smallest person um, or the most insignificant person in terms of the lineup of staffing can actually be the person that helps things go forward. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, and just thank you again uh, for this invitation. And I'm looking forward to our roundtable discussion. Thank you all.
Thank you, Nadine, very much. Our next speaker uh, is Katucha Bento. She's lecturer in race and decolonial studies at, in the Department of Sociology, School of Social and Political Sciences, uh, uh, Science, and the Associate Director of Race Ed at the University of Edinburgh. Her background is rooted in the black movement in Brazil, Samba community, and Quilimbo territory. She co-founded the Free Afro-Brazilian University, UNAFRO, is that? UNAFRO. UNAFRO, aiming at promoting educational spaces using decolonial perspectives. Her focus in theory and praxis center black feminisms, decoloniality, queer studies, and anti-racist pedagogy to work creatively and with subverse language in translation and neologisms, affect affect community, artistic expressions in queer and black subculture, and in collaboration with peers attentive to promoting ethics of caring and power to the people. So let's welcome uh, Katucha. Do you know how to get? <laughs> if you share the screen, uh, but if you choose desktop one, which will be the first option that should come up for sharing your screen, don't share the PowerPoint. Um, choose desktop one, and then if you go into PowerPoint and open the presentation from there, that should work nicely. Cool. Perfect. We're seeing that beautifully online. Is it coming up on the screen in the room? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, it's very nice to be here. It's an honor to be here, to be honest, uh, with this panel of amazing women, amazing black women. We must highlight the connections that uh, put us together in diaspora, in affecting memory. Um, thank you, Desha, for organizing this. Thank you, Ayash, for hosting this, Ben, to be on the background. Nadine and Chantelle uh, for uh, being in this dialogue and Lisa for inspiring us every day. Uh, beyond the things that I will be able to actually put into words here and but I'm sure that some of the things that we acknowledge are in our hearts and the ashe that we exchange as Ashe, I mean, as the candomblé words that we use for the power of creation, the power that puts us to take another breath every day, every second. So I will speak to a topic that is very important to me as, as um, Desha presented. Uh, I have roots in the Black Brazilian movement. I have roots in Samba movement, in Samba community, and also in Quilombo. Um, I will just briefly explain Quilombo or the uh, similar to Mahonage uh, communities in the Caribbean, in Latin America, Quilombos were simplistically explained as spaces where runaway enslaved people would go to create their own communities free from the slavery system. But it is actually a place where Afro-Brazilian culture, spirituality, knowledge is protected and how we envisage a different way to be together, to build community. Um, so that's what I want you to hold on to as I will talk about the project that I am doing and developing right now, and also how Quilombo became something that we can carry with us as people who can protect, reproduce uh, the praxis, the knowledges, the spirituality, the culture of our African ancestors. And there is a, a beautiful uh, author, her name is Beatriz Nascimento, she says, I am Atlantica. I am the Atlantic. I carry the Atlantic with me. I am a Quilombo, therefore, because I am this ocean of 
uh, of of place of context in which the black diaspora comes and loses and that's how i protect my black ancestors my black culture my black spirituality so i will talk through this idea of quilombo and i will address the idea that lisa is a quilombo um, now uh, the project that I'm talking about is called Reexistence and Healing in Brazilian Rural Community, Weaving Solidarity During the Pandemic. So a brief a context, the, during the, co the COVID pandemic, uh, many rural communities uh, were at great risk because of the lack of food access, the high prices of food. Um, now, uh, Brazil got back to the map of hunger. Um, so the lack of information and the lack of access to education was also as a domino effect as people had to go back to the to the communities and most of them didn't have access to the online classes that were made so popular uh, in so many different contexts including brazil rural communities were suffering from high prices of agroecological materials and that's from seeds to tools much ma machinery uh, to grow their own food um, and having an accessible way to be sustainable as they used to be. That's one of the cases of this Colombo that I'm talking about. Um, so the project was about, was in, situated in Ile Ache de Ansan, which is in Araras, the countryside of, of Sao Paulo, south, su southern region in Brazil. Uh, and well, by aiming at addressing to hunger, we uh, restored the community garden so they could grow their own herbs, the they corn, uh, yam. Uh, we, we wanted to, to plant also beans, but because of the climate change and the high prices, we wouldn't be, be able to do that. So I will show you what happened. Um, also to share knowledge and disseminate the situated knowledge that they had there they have there so how do we formalize or validate the language that are the, the knowledge that is situated there with people who are not really academics so mm, we organize workshops from the workshops we are transcribing some of the uh some of the lectures and that's going to become a book chapter, for example. We're organizing a book now. But anyway, uh, there are many aspects of the, in terms of the outputs of the project, but the core of the project was to, to engage the community in, uh, in, the, in the knowledge that they already know, to produce, give them space and some kind of space to breathe, uh, a little bit more relaxed in such an emergency uh, situation, which was the COVID during 2021 um, because uh, things were really, really difficult. Now, um, Donel Yassi, which is the elder of the house of Ilea Shedding and Se, the one on the picture, said, we know that sometimes people search words of his wisdom to help them decide things, but these are things that are already resolved within themselves but it's but instead of mass but they don't have the courage so they come they need help a little push to conceive the life that they have within respect to the human beings is our motto here knowing that our blackness must be understood in our way of life now respect to the human beings she's not trying to depict the all lives matter what she's trying to say is that here our black ancestry is very important at the core of how we respect humanity and moreover she's always saying we respect all beings so the dogs are are the ones that we exchange blessings when we arrive as well as the birds as well as all the beings that are there including the pigs but that's another story. But that's the story that we have there. Uh, and I wanted to situate this three, um, three elements that link with the way I was 
conceiving or thinking about the project and now with all these narratives interpreting or analyzing what I learned from it um, which is also something that yeah helped us creating the UNAFRO the Afro-Brazilian the Free Afro-Brazilian University which is these three words rethink rediscovery rethink and rewrite and I will explain that to you rediscovery the word of rediscovery makes makes fun of the use of the compass that the colonizers who upon arriving in the americas thinking they were in india named the peoples they encountered as indians historically the names of hundreds of indigenous populations were erased and the compass of knowledge and validation of silence pointed to continents of the global north the idea of the compass is a metaphor that does not intend to be presented as a singular or essentializing way, but a way to provoke necessary encounters with ancestry, the stories erased or distorted in the course of history, and above all, to promote the re-encounter. With the revolutionary solidarity and love that, we ki that were kidnapped from the shores of West Africa in the colonization process, to paraphrase Audre Lord, we try to rediscover that love and our narratives and our existence. The idea of rediscovery seeks to understand the temporalities that overlap the positions and impositions of racial and color hierarchies beyond 1942 in the capture of Granada when colonial theorists indicate how the beginning of a colonizing process that reached the people of global south with such violence of genocide, epistemic, spiritual, human, and geographical killing and violence. Weaving the geographical context in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, and the cultures, knowledges, ancestry, and affect that circulates us through the black diaspora, informing what Lelia Gonzalez called Amefrica Ladina. It's the geographical and the, the epistemological together. So Amefrica Ladina is more like a method of how we put them together, all these cultures, all these knowledges, instead of just um, situating geographically how we are connected. Rethinking. Rethinking reveals itself as a re revolutionary act of encompassing knowledge about our context and self-understanding. It is from the critical understanding of the dialogical relationship between subject and society that we can launch a curriculum, a research, a conversation, a walking tour um, that is aligned with the current questions of anti-racist movements that have an impact of transnational solidarity. Rethinking beyond such chronological lines that demarcate the definitions of who we are is subversive. It's, very, it's a subversive way to reaching ancestral knowledge and redefining our histories so that we can rewrite them and then rewrite. It is with the colonial proposal that I am trying to think when approaching the curricular research uh, walking toward educational formations, that individuals and collectives who were erased by the hegemonic canons constituted by the Eurocentric, masculine, hetero, cis normative and white perspective. Also Christian. The presence of voices erased in, hi erased in history is a strategic form of a Mefrica Ladina methodology, opens this space to transmit knowledge within the dialogue, the scope between formal and informal education. In other words, it brings the formality of permanence, institutionalization and conversations so that students, the teachers, the non-academic people, the activists, the artists, the, the, the capoeira dancers, uh, the samba community uh, can contribute to our construction of rewriting our history and the formality that can also be occasional, uh, but always framing the multiculturalism from, 
careful with that word, <laughs> or the multi uh, layers of our connections that theoretical and practical approaches can strengthen our educational practice, our decolonial goals. Now, I'm sorry, I know that I already passed three minutes from my time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, show you a little bit of what I'm talking about in regards to that project. This is where you are hosted when you arrive, and this is our, um, this is the, the dog that we change, exchange blessings with. Uh, Doné Oyas is there, and that's where, the, in the kitchen, where everything is prepared from the sacred offerings for the Orishas to the, um, to the food that we are going to, to eat. Um, the project also opened opportunities for international uh, solidarity, which is like uh, in, in orange. You can see uh, we got a, an international visitor, uh, Sheldon, uh, who came from Edfu Foundation in the US, um, to talk about how we can bridge the solidarity. How can we uh, discuss about food sovereignty, la land rights, and develop more uh, workshops together in dialogue between Global South and Global North. Um, there are more uh, aspects of the impact of retelling our histories and her stories uh, with the aim of healing within the community. So we are talking about the human beings understanding the healing, but also how the land is healing. So from the beginning, this is one, one way that it was right in the beginning, then the, the process. This is actually a video. This is the corn uh, process. Um, yeah, the, the, the moment they were treating the, the soil to plant the, the, the seed of corn, and this is the corn already like uh, growing. So we're talking about the healing from inside out, from deep, deep layers. And the final, linking the legacies of anti-racist struggle with Lisa Williams' legacy uh, here and there. So what I understand in this um, work of retelling the stories that link the black presence in diaspora, uh, whether it is in Scotland, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, together, weaving that as a, as a political, as an emotional and educational labor that um, Lisa promotes in retelling the stories, re inviting us to rediscovery, inviting us to rethink and rewrite our own histories with our own uh, ancestrality and black uh, presence here and there. So thank you, Lisa, for that. And well, thank you, the Quilombo Anastasia, for such a space for me to yeah. to talk and discuss this, uh, yeah, in more depth. I think I stopped sharing. It's yeah. Thank you, thank you, Katucha. That was great. Um, and our last speaker is Chantel George. It, are you there, Chantel? I am. Uh, can you see me? Yes. Yes. Chantel George is a lecturer in history at the University of Glasgow. She's also a member of the Beniba Center for Slavery Studies. Chantal was born in Northwest London to, Gren to Grenadian parents. After hearing stories uh, about Grenada's rich cultural heritage, she decided to research, research this area by pursuing an MA in Caribbean history um, at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. And then follow, she followed that up with a PhD in African history at SOAS, University of London. She currently teaches topics related to transatlantic slavery and at the University of Glasgow. Her forthcoming book titled The Yoruba Are on a Rock, 
Liberated Africans and African Work in Grenada, investigates the origins, experiences, and legacies of, of recaptive Africans in Grenada who were sent to the island following enslavement. Chantel's also working on a global history of the African cola nut. So thank you, Chantel. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Daisha. I'm so happy to be there, to be here, and sorry that I can't join in person. Um, and thrilled to participate alongside Katucha and Nadine. There's so many synergies between our work, and so this is a really exciting opportunity to think about those more clearly, more closely. So I want to introduce my work talking about a source. And I hope that I can share my screen, so I'll just attempt to do that. Okay, so let me know if there's uh, a pause or it's static, um, but I think this may work. So, the source I'm going to introduce is a rare account of African derived practices on the island of Grenada in the 19th century, specifically called African work, very similar to um, what Katusha mentioned, the Orisha or the, the veneration of the Orishas in Brazil, a similar practice derived from the Yoruba Fon peoples of Western Africa. And then I'll return to that later to talk about archival practice. So in, 1880s, in the 1880s, an unnamed elderly black woman guided Hesketh Bell, a colonial administrator to a spring on the island of Grenada. Bell was curious about such sites after hearing of its medicinal healing practices and their dread and uncanny reputations among the black population. Although he dismissively described the regard African Grenadians held towards these places, Bell could not have discovered the spring's location or heard about its practices without the knowledge of this black woman who is unnamed. So beyond the bush and the calabash trees, he writes, he stumbled upon a range of objects that convinced him that he was in a temple dedicated to some mysterious rites and ceremonies, he calls it. And so he lists some, describes some of these objects, a broken cutlass stuck into the ground. In front of that, there were flowers and cola nuts in an earthenware um, jug. Near that was a rough wooden cross. He writes, look at anything but at home in that outlandish company. Near the spring's orifice, he also noted some additional flowers and more cola nuts <coughs> around the ground. He concluded his description of objects, rusty nails, feathers, fish bones, and such like obia were suspended on the branches of the bushes all around. Now, spiritual practices unfamiliar to 19th century Europeans throughout enslavement to, were commonly dismissed um, by the catch-all term obia in the British Caribbean. Arising from enslaved peoples throughout the British Caribbean, and Grenada was no exception, Obia encapsulated a range of beliefs and practices which drew on, which drew on the diverse African cultural origins of the enslaved. So Obia could, um, was used for bringing good fortune, healing, divination, avenging wrongs, protecting against harm. So you can see how its use was instrumental during transatlantic slavery. So, however, through observing ceremonies and talking to practitioners in Grenada, it's evident that the shrine bell, the scene bell described was not in fact evidence of obia. Rather, it was a shrine used within a specific religious system, which as I mentioned earlier, originated among the Yoruba Fon peoples of Western Africa, known as Orisha worship, venerating Orishas. And in Grenada, this practice is known as African work. The seemingly disparate elements, the flag-like material, the cutlass, flowers, cola nuts, and the cross are emblematic of the reinvention of this shrine onto a new landscape, characterized by the fusion of European, African, Creole religious expressions. Within African work, spiritual workers commonly erect, commonly erect a shrine or altar for the veneration of deities, called Orishas. In this case, the shrine is dedicated to Ogun, 
the Orisha of iron warfare and hunting symbolized by these broken nails and cutlasses. Flowers are common um, and useful deities, um, including Ushun and Yamanja, important in African work. Kola nuts used in West African cultures for divination um, and medicinal um, use too. And I mentioned my second project connected with that. Lastly, the wooden cross encountered by Bell was not out of place. Catholicism and other Christian traditions were incorporated into African work and at times could be reinterpreted within African cosmology. So his description of the springs speaks about the diverse practices involved in African work by the late 19th century. And this black woman also informed Bell that those who came to worship at the springs, and I've got a description here on top, um, the first, second line, Africans, i.e. African-born peoples, Creoles, African Grenadians, and Kuli, a derogatory term for descendants of indentured Indians, tells us something about the various practices that were involved and peoples too in the making of African work by the 19th century. So, and this introduces my work on the first part of my work is studying, well, the first project rather, I'm studying Yoruba um, cultural legacies on the island of Grenada, the legacies of these Yoruba indentured or recaptured Africans. How was African work formed? Um, and I look at transnational, transregional factors that were integral in um, the creation of this. So it's not, it was not just a legacy of indentured or recaptured Yoruba. There were significant exchanges throughout the island, um, such as what happens on that, what happened on that spring, on those spring um, that Heskip Bell observed, what happened at springs and water sites such as those. Exchanges across the Eastern Caribbean and throughout the wider Atlantic world. And I draw on traditional archive, interviews with practitioners and descendants of recaptured people and song. And the next project is Colin Light in the Atlantic World. And it's really interesting to think about this and especially our theme of today of healing. So it rethinks the relationship between African descended peoples and the history of global commodities. So often when you hear about commodities in the Atlantic context, we hear about sugar, you might hear about rice, but what about the role of Africans in not only producing such commodities, but distributing them, exchanging them and consuming them? So I think the Kola is a perfect example of looking at these role of, roles of enslaved as well as free Africans. So the first objective is to chart the complex history and wide ranging influences of the nut in Africa, the Circum Caribbean, Europe and North America. Um, from the 1500s to 1900s, and highlight the long neglected role of Africans and their descendants as distributors and consumers. There's fascinating accounts of the Kola nut or history being taken across the Middle Passage by enslaved peoples, grown on provision grounds, and Kadusha spoke about the importance of the land and these grounds, um, and the Dean too, this is integral, thinking about this space away from the plantation used by enslaved and later um, emancipated peoples, um, indentured workers too. Um, the land was important in growing crops for medicinal as well as liturgical um, uses, such as the kola nut. So, um, for that project, I use traditional archives, oral history, art, literature, and poetry and song to stress Africans as um, more than producers of agricultural commodities. They were also distributors and consumers. So thank you very, very much. And I look forward to the remaining questions. Thank you, Chantel. That was great. Um, okay, so um, if maybe uh, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but if Lisa and Katucha would um, come maybe to the front. And Nadine, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. So um, I think. I think the questions I had uh, were, I think, more or less covered. 
Yeah. So, so I think, I think we can just do a little bit of both, which is have a, have our roundtable discussion to, 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 to talk about the idea of black the you know, black archival practices. Um, this question of that I'm, I'm, I've, I've integrated this question brought up by Hartman in her essay Venus in Two Acts of, of how does how does one how do we uh, revisit the scene of subjection uh, without re 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 without replicating the grammar of violence, and I feel like what we what we heard from our three speakers were were three very different, but also interwoven examples of how that is done, just through the through the through the through their presence and through their work. So maybe we can talk about that um, as well, and also bringing the second question. I think right I think right away it, it follows up as well, which is to think about how how Lisa's work is integral to this and, and again coming back to that um, that um, that sent that central idea that I thought about in terms of the work of healing what history and and uh, incidentally what also what sociology geography um, other 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 approaches that we are doing in our in our in our everyday work also is the work of healing so maybe let's start uh, with that um, I'm gonna turn this this is what yeah. we were told to do mm -hmm. okay. everybody in the oh, okay I'll come closer so that yeah it works <laughs> Hi, oh yeah so that I think works. It, yeah that works okay so and I can still see Shanta yeah we can still see Shanta <laughs> anybody want to start with that or jump in I could uh, say something about uh, how not to reproduce this, the violence as we do with this work because in the process of healing and this is something that I well in the black history walking tour Lisa often says yeah but uh, there are people who come and you can see that they are remembering or they have families family members who are involved in a particular situation um, and from the project that I uh, that I'm doing on healing uh, we can see that it's not and I don't have the the intention to romanticize the space of Kilombo and that's why healing is in the continuous use of the verb because as we are root pain and trauma it is not always like Oh my God, we love each other all the time. We are dealing with trauma. We are dealing with sometimes the clashes that it's going to happen uh, in the process of, you know, not sometimes coming, coming across as delicate, as affected and gentle all the time. And the holding space for that, I think it's crucial politically so we don't reproduce that violence, that colonial violence in our work. Uh, so this is not just uh, as, a, as a researcher, as a scholar, but someone who is a member of a community who is dealing with people in, in their modes of, know, of patriarchy or, or the trauma of racism or sexism or domestic violence. Uh, so I think that's a, that, is, that is an, an ongoing tension that we need to be uh, careful in how we engage with these topics. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it is an ongoing negotiation about how you situate yourself, which is not always going to be the same. We need to accommodate, we need to, to change uh, as we engage in those deep dialogues regarding our traumas, regarding the colonial, what the colonial legacy left to us to rebuild something different. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I think that's more like, uh, the, the answer is more like the ongoing negotiation of that and having this constant uh, way to adapt our own positionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wanted to really highlight um, and thinking about Hartman, the work uh, that you have recognized from talking with Lisa around healing, I can't stress 
how absolutely critical that is. Um, sometimes I go into archives and I'll see a box and I realize I have to wrap my head and like glove my hands before I actually handle that material. It sometimes I've been in places where it things smell like blood, literally. I think um, I'm thinking on the courage to talk about the spirit of the thing and the healing of the thing because academia does not generally like to you to consider that. Sidia Hartman herself said it. She has said that she she did lose your mother separately from scenes of subjugation because she understood if she had put the two together, her book would not necessarily have been taken seriously. And so it is actually with courage to talk about these these intangibles that come with doing this particular work. And I want to address something that Chantel said and, and what um, Katusha said, um, and, and to speak from a, a Jamaican perspective, where Chantel is speaking about recovering um, from that discursive violence of calling African traditions obia or black magic and those bits and pieces um, I would say how I hear her and what I've been looking at um, is Kumina in Jamaica, um, which we understand to be um, uh, those those uh, indentured Africans that were from a Kikongo background that brought us a healing. I cannot even express it. And how Rex Nettleford, one of our greatest queer road scholar, academic choreographer, National Dance Company. It's a joy. My aunt is online and she was part of that beginning, that first iteration of the dance company. And I have always wondered what negotiation was it for Rex to talk to those Kumina practitioners for them to allow him to choreograph that parts of those rituals to be part of our national dance repertory of, of, of a particular choreography that is like it literally is a the gift of extending healing to those of us that had had an, a particular enslaved history that um so when when i say um indentured africans these are folks that um it's for folks who may not know the british had you know ending the slave trade had then intercepted other slave ships from like Spain and, and Portugal. And then we're like, well, we're not gonna return these folks. And so they were sent to like Sierra Leone. And then uh, then at, at a point they were, there's a whole lot of discussion around that, uh, came, you know, were invited to, or kind of had to make a decision to come to the Caribbean to work. So the British are very clear they weren't enslaved, but there wasn't a lot of necessarily choice, but they came under different conditions. And so it's a, it's a particular gift of healing um, that that is part of an archive, really, right? So when when Katricia says, you know, what is a kilombo? What is an art? You know, what is held in that archive? For me, it, it's 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 performed, um, but I it, it is it's it's an absolute gift. It's an, a gift uh, that is extended to us every time it is performed um, as part of our national history. My hair always stands on end with this because I haven't seen people discuss it in detail, but I, I know this to be true, you know, um, and how, you know, how it was woven in um, from an academic who was also a dancer. I was quite clear about that. Um, so those, those are the things I, you know, I think of when we, we make a commitment to naming it the work that we do around he like healing um, in order to not and, and to the ethics of how we how we bring forward the work some things I will not include that I find it, it could be that it would be like oh I, you know this has never been published before you know mm -hmm. and it's just like this is not this is not going out within that format and and you have to make a choice about that every time you open a box mm -hmm. um, and I think about Lisa in terms of the kinds of encounters that she has daily with what people bring, like every time she does these talks, what people bring, what doing these talks brings out of them. I suspect she's a listener, like she listens to the audience as well and no talk is necessarily the same. The, the places might be similar, but what she's, what she's called to speak on is a larger, you know, a larger repertory of information that 
what I would have seen when I went on tour with her, you know, a couple of years ago. And and it, that it's her, it's the work to manage all of those forces, you know, as a frontliner with encountering this stuff that is how she inspires me, even when I'm just handling a box of paper. Jimmy, I, I know I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with lots of history or families, etc. It's It's alive for me. It's always alive. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Um, so for me, I think it's really interesting to think about negotiation, negotiation and the archives and do say we make these decisions, um, negotiation among enslaved and indentured Africans at these springs or at these sites of cultural recreation, the importance of, as Andine said, our ancestors bring to us a healing practice. Um, and so how do we represent such histories? How do we talk about them? So one of the things that informs my work is uh, Marissa Fentes's approach, um, which involves stretching the archival fragments because we're left with bits, painful bits, bits of our histories. And how do we use that to draw out these marginalized voices and experiences, especially thinking about the black woman that I mentioned before who was unnamed in the source. How do, we, how do we do this? How do we shift this archival gaze, as Fuentes writes, away from white men, such as Belle, to this elderly black women and other um, African descended folks? And I, and I find Hartman's critical fabulation interesting, right? Encouraging us to think about ways of, <clears throat> excuse me, storytelling um, and using speculative narration to tell that story, being creative. Um, what did these sites mean to enslaved and indentured workers and their descendants? How did they articulate um, and what were their feelings of hope um, and remembering? Um, and again, this resonates with Nadine and Katusha's work, thinking about sites beyond the plantation, right? And, you know, um, within these bushes or among these calabash trees or um, on the Kalimbo or um, on these spaces away from the plantation as Sylvia Winter encourages us to think about. Um, so thinking about what happens there as intellectual and creative content is so interesting as something that I'm grappling with. Think about these oral histories. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's really key. Um, so not only can we tell that history of sugar, um, but as um, Katusha mentioned, the importance of yam and these other commodities that meant so much to our survival and our perseverance. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to say thank you so much for putting together this um, day to day and for all of us to come together to make this effort to come here and share together, and Chantal, you included. and. Just, it's quite a strange experience for me hearing you talk about the impact of the work or things that you've noticed or things that you find important about what I do. Um, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, I think what I want to say is something that I was going to say when I was going to speak this afternoon, but I think I'm going to say this now. And I think there's two things that are coming to mind for me. Um, having lived in Grenada for the majority of my adult life, my 20s and 30s, and being feeling connected to the land, walking the land, and then coming to Edinburgh, when I'm, when I'm speaking about some of these histories that connect back to the Caribbean directly, there's a part of me that feels transported back to those places where I've walked. The, what I want to say, I think, in terms of talking about healing and talking about the importance of the heart in, in this work. So thinking about how capitalism and the system that we're inhabiting now, encouraging, it's a culture of acquisition and it's encouraging us to go against love all of the time. So the words I was thinking of is encouraging us, seducing us, Cajoling us, 
to go against making decisions out of love. And I think for me, when I'm trying to do this work, thinking about how, what this repression of human empathy does to ourselves and does for the kinds of decisions that we might make that will affect other people's lives and thinking about this in, in general. So I suppose what I'm trying to do is think about those things, the, the, the points where you might be encouraged to inflict some sort of violence, however small that might seem, mm -hmm. and to, to notice those times, to reflect on those times, to encourage other people to also do that in their own lives and in their own practice and choose something else, to choose love at that particular point. So I think that's what I'm, the heart of what I'm trying to do, I think, with my work, and seeing that in all of your work as well, and being very inspired and encouraged by that, and beautiful synergies between um, what everybody's trying to do at this point, and are doing at this point. Um, so I don't know if that was a, a direct answer to that question, yeah, I think yeah. that's what came up for me is, yeah, that's important. Okay, so what we're going to do now, because we're kind of running out of time, and I want to get the audience and, and speaking as well um, as soon as possible, you can all kind of jump in. So what, what I'm going to do now is uh, open the floor for questions. First, um, with the, those of you who are here in attendance, um, and then with those of you who are with us via Zoom. So I'm gonna start collecting some questions and if there's anybody here who wants to make a comment or ask something, um, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Dasha, for organizing this and for helping to disseminate Lisa's work. Um, so my question is to the three speakers. Um, so to, um, to think more about this, the healing process, part of what we do as academics is um, we put ourselves and our bodies into places that are complicated, hard, violent, um, or often we don't know how to deal with, or everything being the same, you have to kind of protection over yourself, deal with things. Um, and part of that is, a, a, and there's a kind of, um, part of the kind of subject of healing is about us in that position, um, between that complicated, in your case, complicated histories, complicated past and, you know, violent present. Um, but then I'm wondering, what is it that you do with this? What is it that you do with this? What is it you do with this material? Um, so who are the audiences? What form does these stories and these histories take? Um, do they always have to be books? Books that then find themselves in libraries? I mean, Lisa's is a great example of other alternatives and other ways of um, sharing that, those stories, sharing those histories, sharing that knowledge, extending that healing. But as academics, are books really the only way we can do this? I think that's a great question to pose to all, uh, all of us who are thinking about you know, uh, negotiating this with academia when we present our work as well. Um, in the case of this project, because I think this project is very special, because I didn't create it by myself, it was also a demand or the shape that it took was a demand from the Kilombo. Uh, so I will address to the fact that uh, the Kilombo was made one of the touristic place in Araras because of the historical heritage that it contains. Uh, so one of the workshops of the project was to teach the, uh, one of the people who studied that, taught the, the community how to engage with other Quilombo communities or agricultural communities, how to make like a touristic tracks within the city 
you know, not only to create solidarity among them, but also to create paths of um, of people circulating, also a, a way to to make money and uh, and and professional opportunities there. Um, we had uh, people taking videos, not only professional, so it's not only going to be academic and going to be have a different impact throughout all these three, so people can watch and understand the knowledge that, it, that is there, they want to share, because they decided and they made their own agenda and they created the content that they wanted, that they wanted to do. Um, also, like workshops with braiding hair, uh, so they talked about blackness and they, they also, within the workshop, they had to negotiate the state of blackness and braiding hair and cultural consideration and so on. But it was interesting to show each other how they also professionalize the, the group as uh, braiding hair. So there are other, other things that we could take from it that would never be able to become just both and I agree with you that that's a very simplistic way to see the impact or, or the results of the things we're doing. Uh, but ultimately what I wanted to say in response to not only making that even if it's just the videos or the workshops but I think it's also what Lisa said regarding the love that we usually don't, I don't know, it's a language that it's, it's very erased in, in the way we deploy academic work and I think this, well, this needs to be a little bit, maybe at the forefront, a little bit, no, but what I mean is the language that needs to be at the forefront of our methods and the and the results that we actually exchange. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's for me, it's ultimately the most important thing. Chantal, did you have a... Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's a fabulous question. Um, so, um, I've done some field work in Grenada many years ago, 2015 and previously. And one of the things that I do, apart from learning, because there's so much that has not been told, there's so much I have not been told about my, my culture, um, is learn and really appreciate. And I think that it was a challenge going to these sites because often um, my gram parents would say Chantal be careful this person so and so doing obia my you, you get yourself caught up in certain things and <laughs> as someone new to the field of studying you know doing field work in Grenada it was a challenge um and so I think sharing you know is closer at home also with your family um dispelling certain myths that they may have about our shared past. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is building a digital history website or database to showcase or to share this knowledge, but also understanding that it's collaborative, right? There's so many things that, for example, the elderly Black women in that 19th century account told Bell, Hesketh Bell, that maybe absent or maybe she did not tell him because secrecy is important in preserving our traditions and, and protecting people. But understanding that there are many people, you know, outside academia who have knowledges about our past. It's not just to pre the preserve of um, academia. So sharing that knowledge, having a place where people can collaborate online is an important avenue. Yeah, I, I think it's very quickly, if I could say, like, um, uh, for example, I'm thinking about Uchenna Nehwe's work uh, on documenting um, Black composers through time. She has a website called Plain Sight Song, which is an open database that anybody can go to. She says, like, drop a little money for a coffee. But it's quite brilliant, um, and that she works with musicians to 
bring those those pieces to life you know is a separate way in terms of books for me um there's a couple of things i would i would agree with chantelle i always make sure i have elders traveling with me with the work that i'm doing there's not nothing that i do that they don't know what i'm doing it's just like to check in uh and especially elders are not connected to academia at all my mom was first my parents are both first in their family fits and i'm a non-traditional student I think uh, I would just say there's two things. One with publishing, um, I always think about the the kids at the National Library in Jamaica, where they would have uh, access. So whatever I've been published is, is open access, so that they can they literally could find it, right? That's a that's something that's my own personal piece. But my joy has been working with students at Birkbeck in a class that was called Creative Archives. Uh, I think the first step, even before things are produced, is that people, for me, my interest is that people feel like the archives belong to them. Like they feel like they can go in. And I would say that was one of the, the greatest lessons that I, I had once, you know, because my mom was all around, like, you know, running too. And one day, um, uh, uh, some, uh, some indigenous students looked at me and they said, we don't, we don't have the same joy about libraries that you do. We just thought we'd mention it. They're actually a frightening place. They're a place of power where decisions were documented to harm us. And, you know, I then understand my privilege and like step back and one day I, there was a library door I couldn't enter. Like I had that momentary feeling of what it means like to be daunted. And so for me, before the book, so it's absolutely key, poetry, um, uh, practice-based things where it's it's not just uh, uh, in your head it's literally uh, working with students for me it's always about practice based like you come through with the knowledge in your body but really for me it's about opening the doors um, for people to feel they can go in um, anybody who asks me about the National Archive knows like if you are not treated well in any way you let you know you like let me know do you know what I mean like it's key on that so far so good but there are other forms of access, like deaf students that I've worked with, like even getting in through the door where people are daunted. Um, but yeah, I, I think in a digital age, that allows for other ways of, of presenting material in a, in a living format, and I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, any other questions? Because we do have a very lively um, chat <laughs> going on. Um, and. I think, um, Ben, if you're still there, could we yeah. get people to speak their question? Is that, is that We can do, yes. Um, if they use the raise hand button, I can authorize them to speak and turn their microphones on. Um, there's a question, one question has been put in the Q&A as well, which you can, you'll, if you go to the bottom of the screen, it'll pop up there. But there are obviously lots of questions in the chat as well. Okay, so the first question is from Je Jeddah and uh, um, it says, uh, thank, thank you to the panel for uh, what kind words of self-care and, me oh, sorry, what kind, what kinds of self-care mental health practices are important to you when moving through archives that are at times dealing with traumatic histories and, uh, and his histories, her stories and histories? I think that's a very important question. I think that's something I think all of us have had, um, had experience with. Right, that that, mm -hmm. and for me, it's that that having to, having to make a physical distance between myself and the archive because of that. That sometimes finding yourself, finding your family, which happens to me, happened to me, look looking for enslaved women in the archives in St. Vincent and, and finding Mary Osborne. Mm -hmm. Finally, getting that connecting, that connecting presence to my to my to, to my past, to my future. Uh, and the present, and it, it I was unprepared emotionally and mentally for that, mm -hmm. and then having to take, and for me it was it was having to take a space away from it. But what 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 are some of your self care, or if anyone else has some similar experience? I think even talking to people who understand effortlessly brings a sense of comfort, brings a sense of lightness keeping the connection and also the value of rest which I'm really starting to understand so when when I was I was lying this morning and getting lots of thoughts and that kind of in-between hypnagogic state 
And I thought, yes, actually, this is the time I need to pay more and more attention to. Sometimes those thoughts will disappear if I try to write them down. So I'm trying to convert them into something, into a form that doesn't always fit. So I decided to record some of those wisps in a sleepy voice this morning and actually then started to write, write them down. And I think it's about what came to me this morning is the importance of what you are listening to at that particular at those particular moments that that's the truth that you're connected to at that point before the external noise comes in and drowns it out and starts to drag you emotionally in lots of different directions so it's about remembering to come back to center and to make that space to coming back to center to ground and to earth and also connect with nature again as well if you're in the caribbean it's easy to do for most people right um but if you're in a, in a city, you have to really re, you have to go and find the trees. Basically, you need to go and find and be re-energized by nature once more. So I think those two things are simple, but sometimes easy to ignore because we get swept up in um, trying to do too many things at, at um, and too much, perhaps. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions? that uh, questions that have been already stated, would you like to restate it for the, for the panel to hear and respond to? If there's one hand up in the chat, I will let that person talk. Go ahead. That's somebody called, just called local account. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm not sure why I'm called local account. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Gita Marcus, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a senior lecturer and teacher education at um, Queen Margaret University. And um, like you all, I'm a fan of Lisa's, and she recently did a tour um, with, um, fair to say, the majority white students uh, who are going to teaching community work, educa adult education and all. And many of them were absolutely stunned, surprised, as you can imagine, and questions as to why they have never heard about some of the stories that, that Lisa uh, was sharing with them as they toured Edinburgh, looking at it in a very different light. So one of the reasons why I asked this question about safe spaces and brave spaces is because I'm time and time again, it's particularly when working in, uh, in, in uh, higher education, um, as I am now, I, I feel like I'm in a parallel universe in the sense that there is this one path where I have white allies, students that are keen to learn, want to understand, who uh, are angry and want to make change. And then on the <laughs> other side, I'm also having to deal with people who are criticizing, are uh, complaining to uh, management um, that they don't want to hear about race, uh, they don't want to hear about decolonizing the curriculum because there is no racism. <coughs> what is there to decolonize anyway? So it's these are I guess it's it's that it's that space between that I am I would like some advice on how do I bridge that that parallel uh, that parallel universe that I think a lot of us are in. And the word rest is, is, is clearly crucial. So that's why I asked that question. Okay. I think one of my, um, one of the things that's important for me to do when I'm doing the tours, and I'm sure you notice this Gita, and I often end with it as well, is, is show many instances over the centuries where you've had multi circle racial coalitions of people from different backgrounds coming together to fight for freedom. So people can find themselves within that somehow a bit more easily. Um, I think that's important. Also, sh really explaining how a system came about, the social constructions of race, where do these things begin? Um, how a system develops that we've all part of and we're affected by in different ways. But people take it less personally if you really start to explain this and you sort of work there. Um, and then also acknowledging, it's sometimes difficult for people to do because I think as a British culture generally is not good at, 
identify even feeling emotion in the body also identifying what that is and also being able to to vocalize that especially in a group with other people feeling people feeling different emotions but that's something i think that is very much lacking in the way that we talk about these things in spaces and we need to acknowledge those kinds of things up front and and get all those elephants out you know you know the elephant in the room talk about that from the very from up you know from the very beginning and i try to do that also on tour as well and i think that makes it a little bit easier to then when these feelings maybe of defensiveness come up or the dynamics are difficult you've already addressed perhaps what this is and people are more able to recognize it um i i would like to just give um a, a, a comment on this so um i've been in classroom settings where uh just multiple people of different racial backgrounds understanding how we've been made complicit in, a, in, in particular sy systems of oppression, right? Um, I would say right now uh, I'm tracking a Scottish individual, uh, male, who, uh, and we were talking about this earlier, um, rather than, uh, one of the things that I think is really important is, is and we're seeing it earlier, the complexity of, of individuals. So when I first started, I was really angry with this dude. Like I went into the record kind of, and rightfully so. It's, it's, not, it's not to say my anger is, is displaced or it was like out of order. It's absolutely in order. However, I began to track his history and I understood a little bit better what, what decisions he made and why he made those decisions. I'm lucky enough that his personal letters are there for me to also see other complexities of how he literally spoke differently to uh, his, his, like in gender in terms of children. Like I literally have a letter written to a son and then a letter written to a daughter a couple of days later. And, and the, the humanity in the letter to the daughter is really quite clear versus the like masculinity to the son. Like, and I think, uh, I think it takes up, the thing is it takes so much time. Whenever I speak to educators, they're like, my God, it's enough trying to do everything much less to try and get down to these granular, granular levels of like being able to present these more complex ideas of people. And it doesn't excuse anybody. And it's not like every person comes with that. I've been lucky to find a vein, a tiny vein, a fragment that gives something of that. And it ties to... The clearing of the highlands it, you know it, it, it like i had to understand that particular history mm -hmm. to understand the kind of decisions he was making right um that he actually was his family is part of going up against the british you know what i mean like and so then i'm like okay wait a minute you know it, it it doesn't change what happened in the caribbean but in some odd way it allows me to go like why was this dude different in terms of his his attention to women do you know what i mean and like small things not perfect many things that were really bad were not written down so it could be there are these other pieces but i found um when i'm dealing with really angry white male students i'll be quite blunt that are like literally trying to deal with what's going on um it, it, it's 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 difficult not to set boundaries right where i'm like actually it's going to take time this is not an intellectual exercise you know um I'm trying to figure out if there, there are like rebels in the family that nobody's talking to or probably the, the relative that can't talk to them about this stuff. Obviously within 13 weeks of a class, all of these <coughs> kind of personal things are, and, and we have to be careful with how much investment we make, you know, like it's a drain on us ourselves, trying to take care of like where our priorities are. But um, the work I do is trying to bring out a complexity um, that I've had the privilege of being able to go into an archive to, to dig um, just to kind of understand and then hopefully uh, folks get over the either guilt, paralysis of guilt or paralysis of anger in terms of paralysis, in terms of empathy and being able to move on the, the allyship we need today, you know, like to, to begin to move on that. So um, I pay attention to cohorts of students and I pay attention to student leadership um, where sometimes it's just another student talking to a student that's actually going to take care of that versus me and a sort of authority or you're going to mark my paper later so I'm not sure if I can trust you. Those are some things. Um, 
in these days and times? Uh, you know, Chantel, sorry, I just wanted to know you're there. Is there something that you might want to say to this question as well, please? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'm new to Scotland, um, and so I've been in Scotland about a year now, and it's really interesting to, to think about the differences um, between the different contexts that I've taught, London, um, upstate New York, Glasgow, totally thinking about the demographic backgrounds of students, how they engage with the material. So far, I've had a very, I find students are very engaged with the subject of slavery, enslavement, especially thinking about how it connects to Scottish history. And it's something that I'm learning about, especially through the work of Lisa, right? Thinking about the, how integral the Caribbean is to Scotland's history and vice versa. So I think students are particularly engaged um, when they can see parallels or they can join the dots between a particular monument, um, a particular individual in their own knowledge of Scottish history and to the Caribbean to see how, to see the relevance of the course I teach, which is called Surviving and Resisting Slavery in the British Caribbean. So seeing those links, seeing those, the violence, um, um, whether, you know, a Scottish um, doctor, missionary, enslaver, and also thinking about the contemporary legacies within Glasgow, again, connected to Lisa's work, um, how do we remember, um, how do we memorialize enslaved peoples? And, you know, the contentious nature of memory, especially concerning Dundas and other um, statues, um, places within Glasgow, how do we, how do we, what do we do with them? Um, should they be in museums? And how do we understand those in relationship to our own histories? Uh, can I just say one thing more? Because I, I believe that inviting students to be out of their comfort zone is very important as a radical practice to understand and be co-responsible for mm -hmm. what is being taught. So it is not just uh, the, the fact that we are as educators are mediating knowledge, are mediating information, but also how they are co-responsible for the things that are, they don't learn, they don't want to learn. Mm -hmm. they, so I, I believe that uh, what you did, Nadine, said uh, about you know, inviting students in from the very beginning is crucial to say, look, this topic is important and the classroom, take the classroom as the radical place of transformation. Mm -hmm. Take that as yours and bring what you think is important. Let's, let's make a debate. Let's, let's try to understand this together. So those who want to withdraw or wants to go like as a counter, you know, a narrative of, you know, what you're teaching in terms of the racial struggle, I think these conversations are the difficult conversations we must be having. And I, I mean, I know it's hard, but inviting them in is, is a way to try to dissolve some of the, the stiff uh, structures of racist narratives, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing I wanted to add mm -hmm. because yeah, I believe it's the dialogical process, not easy to, to build. Brave spaces, I like that, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Gita. Um, there are, as, as Ben indicated, you should raise your hand if you want to, um, if you want to speak. Um, there, there are a couple more questions that have been written in the chat. Um, there is someone in the Q&A, and this was an anonymous attendee who was asking uh, about the how the panel thinks archives can support political movements and local communities today. Mm. How can we make use of what is in the boxes to keep breathing life into ourselves, the present, and the future? It's very difficult. Um, that's a very interesting question. I, I would jump 
in okay. rather quickly, not because I want to <laughs> be on the foot, but I was actually in a cross Caribbean North American conversation around political activism and archives. So the question is, uh, some of our elders that did political activism do not want to put their archives in national repositories. That's a real thing. Some of those things are intangible, like they're, they're just not even, it's, it's just not, like how do you even doc, like capture all of it? Like do we interview them and then put it forward? And so the question has been, um, that I think about often is, um, how, how, do we, how do we ensure, especially when it's a counter movement to mm -hmm. systems, how do we ensure that the community will be able to find it, that it's not suddenly a, a, a closed file <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's it, right? Um, or that it could be used against a community in, 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 in particular. Um, I'll just stop there, that, that's one. I don't know if folks wanna speak on, on local. Um, obviously there's small repositories that are always struggling for funding to keep the door open. Um, I don't believe digital is the absolute way being from the Caribbean where the power can turn off, that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a very real thing. And in this current electricity, like cost of electricity crisis, I think it's a, to actually think about that, right? Uh, but I'll stop there and see if anybody else wanted to, to answer or you know, give, a, give a state or a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to jump in there. I think those are really interesting key observations, thinking about the drawback of the digital environment. Um, it's a really important point. Um, something that I'm thinking about is, so thinking, it's a really interesting question, thinking about the activism historically of certain religious um, communities. So in Trinidad, um, St. Vincent, thinking about the repeal of the spiritual Baptist um, or shelters ordinance in mid 20th century. Um, and I think about Grenada where the ordinance has not yet been repealed, but also how the communities, um, spiritual Baptists, as well as Arisho slash African work communities experience, you know, their practices are stigmatized. Um, largely um, things are changing. There's some representation of spiritual Baptist services on television, but it hasn't um, been, um, the ordinance hasn't been repealed. And this has so many ramifications, people that are practicing. Um, there's a history of repression, but there's also a history of activism. So I think it's so important for those communities um, to engage in, in those archival engage with the archives on that and I think that's got me thinking about how I can engage with those communities surrounding the histories of activism and um, obviously communities are on the ground are aware of these practices um, but it's interesting to think about how those archives can be used in the activism that's a really interesting question I think one of the things we also need is activism <coughs> or an awareness of the activism around conserving the archives as well. How many archives are disappearing as we speak across the Caribbean? People have got the money to preserve it. Um, and that's something that's key and would also be of interest to historians in a place like Scotland as well, for example. So <coughs> I think right now we're, we're at a critical point where they're literally disappearing and turning to dust every day. And that's something um, that I think we need to come together internationally to understand that we can do something about that now. The other thing is thinking about, I was just thinking, Shanta, with what you were saying as well, about the ordinance, but also the kinds of pressures coming in from new missionary activity mm -hmm. in a place like Grenada, from West African people, American people, and people having quite a lot of influence and owning radio stations and that kind of thing. and that continuing to be um, an area where it's difficult to, to get the changes made that are, are needed. Grenada is a very interesting place for lots of different reasons, partly because of the revolution and also a lot of the archives from that period that Grenada doesn't even have access to. Um, and also, I'm thinking about um, 
thinking about archives and let's say even in a place like Edinburgh for example thinking about how we open up even the primary school curriculum or the early secondary curriculum to make sure that the archives are demystified, that there's access to, to go in, that they have the skills also. One, it just becomes a normal, um, more of a normal area of life that they understand very early on. Um, but also the other thing I will add to that is creating an archive of what is going on now as well and how we go about doing that and to make sure that young people have the skills to create an archive of the political activism that has is is now as well, so not just in the past. That's just what I want to add to that. That that's a really big one because people are, like we've moved to a digital space. Like I I remember in talking to somebody and he's like, I'm you know doing a project on this one person, and I was like, Are you capturing their email? And he's like, No. Mm. So you know from a certain period of time where you know people have switched over to to computers etc. That's not part of the archive. It's very paper based. Um, and you know, there's mixed feelings around around digital archives, and, and of course, youth today are more digital. So it's not about being like, come back to paper, you know, mm -hmm. but it is to like think it through on what it means. Um, even the, the loss of a password can make a difference. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. that's it. Like, it, you know, somebody needs a password, and like that thing is stuck. So um, I'm with you. It's like the information and then what holds it. There are different formats, right? Um, but I, again, I think this is our federation granddaughter deal here where like a concern for archives throughout the Caribbean, the small ones, the smaller islands as well is a really huge one accordingly. Um, I think I, I, I saw also somebody brought up extractivism mm -hmm. as well in the chat. And, um, and uh, you know, there are digital, there's an entire digital push that are, you know, it's private corporations that would digitize the whole thing for you. I mean, this is going on right now with the census here in, in the UK, and I sit on the Hees Advisory Group where the census has been digitized by a private company, so it's not gonna be free. Uh, you gotta go to Manchester Central Library, or yeah, it's not free. So my question always is, is like in 200 years or 100 years, is the stuff that was, tra was captured digitally is it still going to cost that much? Because some corporations never seem to make it cheaper. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying to you? Once, once it's out, do you know what I mean? And so yes, there's a cost of processing paper, etc. But as we go along, is it going to be free? Like, can we be sure that it would be? Or is it the cost of electricity is going to mean that? That so ultimately, it's about the access to it, right? Um, and that's a really big one. Um, it's a big question that I have here. But my primary one is the smaller archives. Mm -hmm. Um, in the Caribbean, um, which are crumbling, or St. Lucia is burnt. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That that is very serious um, business, and and to me it's serious because it's personal for Black people. You know what I mean? And we don't get the funding to travel there. Like I'm always seeing white white scholars are like, yeah, I was there and I got funding. And I was just like, mm -hmm. there are our community in the UK, which is one of the most precious diasporas to me as a traveler. Uh, you all earth and hold memory in a particular way about the Caribbean that is very rare and precious to me. And to me, to see youth be able to go to, do you know what I mean, the archive would be like, like get funding that. We don't need another book. <laughs> we need for those youth that hold memory the way their parents gave it to them and then to compare and contrast or be able to challenge the archive. Those are the things that interest me. Um, more than writing a book yeah. and I'll stop there I just wanted to say something to the anonymous attendee uh, uh, especially because Chantal mentioned something about the secrecy of some of the communities that we encounter and this is also in the Colombo where I, I'm doing projects with um, the secrecy the secrets the, the practice of refusal in engaging in institutional language or institutionalized ways of safeguarding the memories is something that is also political. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, well, it is political because of the trauma that is like when practicing certain ways of spirituality or relationship with nature was criminalized, and it still is in Brazil. Um, literally, some 
Candomblé uh, uh, places are being bombarded, literally bombarded in Brazil because of their faith. They don't feel safe in in having that relationship with some institutions. So some of the boxes and the memories are, are in local, in there, and nobody knows about it, and it's, it's there. So there is this relationship of refusal, politics, uh, and trauma that I believe it's, it's there. But yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that as a, a political thing to think about but nothing to solve or, or anything close to that, really. Okay, um, it seems like we're, just, uh, we're done with the questions for now. Um, I'm sure this is gonna continue um, outside. I think, I, I think we all kind of know each other, so we can all circle back and come back to these questions and, and these comments. Uh, we're gonna take a short break for about, maybe 10 minutes, mm -hmm. um, rehydrate, get some tea, um, coffee, water, and then Lisa will have the floor. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. Let's just run, short round of applause for the, for the panel. Thank you so much. And we will re reconvene in, a, in about 10 minutes. Thank you everyone for, for staying with us. We we're still have a full crowd. Um, we're gonna end our event with hearing Lisa, the, the woman of the hour. Um, thank, thank you again, Lisa, for allowing us to do this. Um, so take it away. Thank you so much, Desha. And thank you to Nadine, <coughs> the teacher, and Chantal, and for Ben organizing at IASH today. And thanks so much to everybody for also coming out here today in person who could, and also those of you online and those of you who have asked if there will be a recording, which, which there will be. So I suppose I want to really start with a poem. And it was Nadine, actually, who really encouraged me to think of the importance of touching people in a different way through the heart, through poetry. And it's something that I've included on tours quite, not every tour, but quite regularly now. Um, and I suppose thinking back to when um, Desh was saying at the beginning how we kept meeting in certain places and we kept having conversations and how one day she really reached out and we really started to have an in-depth conversation about doing this kind of work in Scotland. And Desh doesn't mind me sharing that when she thought of me, and when she reached out at that time, she was in A&E. And I said, I have actually been in A&E six times in a row mm. this year. Mm. And a lot of it was to do with having high blood pressure and an abnormal heart rhythm, as they said. And this is something that I want to kind of bring us back to at, at the end of the talk. Um, the importance of the heart and importance of taking care of our own hearts and other people's hearts. Um, yeah. And thinking about the absence of physical touch during lockdown, which many of us and you know many people are still going through at this point with the pandemic, and reaching out to each other over this period being a lifeline and being so important, and that being like a touch in a way, you know. Um, now, I think a lot of the stress that I was going through at the time is something that a lot of us here go through. And it was really to do with the experience of words, not so much falling on deaf ears, but closed hearts. Mm -hmm. And when those words fall on closed hearts, what that does to you internally, and paying more attention to that. So I'm actually going to start with a poem which I wrote. Um, shout out to Scottish BPOC Writers Network. I've got some, um, some of the organisers here today online. And it's a poem called Listen. And we can think of the word listen, of course, in many different ways, as Dash and I have been discussing. Listen to your own blood rise to the occasion. 
charge forth to ring the alarm. Disturb the clean line of your smile you didn't even clock was false. Listen to the putty marinage amongst us, a warning in the pitch and tremble, a deliberate slowing down, a pregnant pause. Listen to the old echoes on the wind, the precious violin with which Douglas turned tragedy to triumph in this city of pompous stone. Listen to the crackle of effigies burning over whimpers of hunger, men hurling carcasses of cats on the king's birthday. Listen to the sons and daughters of Afric run under midnight's cover, broken collars crash to the floors, hungry babies wake to cry. Listen to the essence of our hushed languages gather in the hum of ancestors, shielding us from demons as we walk through graveyards. Listen to our long rage acoustic device, the conch, the drum, the song, Bookman's words still vibrate in the air. Who is the God who has ears to hear? So I woke up this morning thinking about using this poem in a way as a spine for the talk that I wanted to, to give today. So thinking about that time when not really paying attention enough to, as I said in the poem, my own blood rising to the occasion, being in certain situations where um, what I was saying was being deliberately ignored, and this happened over and over again. Thinking, of course, in terms of what my own blood also means in a general sense. So family, ancestors, friends, humanity. And when we get to the next verse, thinking about, I'm going to read actually that next part. Um, listen to the putty marinage amongst us, the noticing, the realising that you're not alone and that comfort that comes with that. Anchoring you back also in your own reality when sometimes you're in situations where you feel like you're being gaslit and you start to think, is it me? Am I being oversensitive? Am I not reading the situation correctly? And then checking in with other people and realising that you are, you're absolutely reading the room in the correct way. When we think about a pregnant pause, we were thinking that, again, that goes back to your talk, Kadisha, thinking about conception, thinking about um, what also develops in the silence and how we can listen to silence and how sometimes we're very uncomfortable here in sitting in silence together and wanting to fill that silence with something. Um, listening to old echoes on the wind and thinking about someone like Frederick Douglass, turning his own trauma into using music to turn that trauma into, into power and into a sense of comfort him, for himself and others. And also thinking about how still we have to have conversations about how we frame people and frame their lives and frame their histories. And even with somebody like Frederick Douglass, who's become more and more revered in a city where he spent time in 1846 and 1847, people still wanting to refer to him as an ex slave and fighting still for the respect and framing of people's stories, which is something I do try to do regularly. And also thinking about how potentially his story, even here in Edinburgh, has the potential to be co-opted. And even he knew that at the time when he was here as well. And the strategies that he, he used in order to navigate the spaces here. Even thinking about uh, a, a youth group that I work with here. Um, young Scottish children, about 10 years old, of black and Asian descent. And asking them what they knew about Rosa Parks, because they wanted to do a drama performance about Rosa Parks. I said, what do you know about Rosa Parks? Did they tell you at school that she was an old lady that sat down one day because she was tired on the bus? They said, yes, that's exactly what they told us. I said, did they tell you that she was a militant activist for several decades before she did that? Did they tell you that she was a follower of Malcolm X? No, they didn't. 
So we had a lot of conversations with those young people about the reality of Rosa Parks and getting them to think about the age of 10, why that narrative may have been changed, who changed it, maybe what the motivations were for changing that narrative. Is it easier for some people to accept by softening her story in that way? Um, now, that's also something that I talk about very much here with teachers, how to frame these histories using empathy, how to think very carefully about the language and the reasons for using a language. I'm not just going to hand you a glossary, but to actually do the work of going away and thinking about what it is you're trying to impart also with respect for people that have been through these experiences. Um, when we get to verse 4, it actually is talking about an event that happened very close to where we are here today, um, actually in George Square in 1792. The crackle of effigies burning of a whimpers of hunger, men hurling carcasses of cats on the king's birthday, I'm referring to the 4th of June 1792, when there were riots against the people in power. So one of the things that I do, like I was saying earlier, is stressing the how many centuries we've had of liberatory movements with people coming together from different backgrounds and fighting for freedom. Thinking about where these ideas of race have come from, thinking about those riots that were against the Dundas family at the time and the kinds of repressive laws that the Dundas family were also um, forcing people into violent systems abroad but also enacting violence here at home to get people to draw and make those connections um, for their own city. Also thinking about this idea that people often come up with, we mustn't put a present lens on the past. Thinking about who was fighting for freedom then. Those folks who were well, perhaps the people in power creating a system where they're not seeing those people as fully human. Not seeing them as the best, not seeing them as the most deserving type of human or even human at all. Those people knew their own worth and those people were fighting against the system at the time. We think about the Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, again with people coming together and causing a threat and creating a threat for the elites. This is something we talk to teachers about to understand these ideas of race, the social construction of race and what they use for, to always be dividing people. How does that show up today with our media? How does it show up today in the kinds of language that we're constantly exposed to in the press? Your pupils and your families. I'm thinking sometimes of small, innocent Scottish children here who have so much love and so much empathy. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Being very struck by them and the kind of very open hearts and the love that they have for people here. And at what point that starts to, to turn and change at times. Also thinking about um, David Pitt coming from Grenada, we were thinking about the Federation and actually looking more at David Pitt's story, coming from Grenada, coming to study in Edinburgh, to study medicine and how so many black intellectuals who came to Edinburgh University studying medicine were also creating huge social change in Britain and across the world. So somebody who also gained some of his political consciousness in the slums of Edinburgh and thinking back to the conditions in Grenada at the time, terrible conditions, and the Moyne report coming out, of course, in the 1930s, and then the push for political change that really started to happen between the wars, and how badly black soldiers were treated during the First World War, and also the rumblings of federation that really start to develop around that time. Um, also thinking about Scotland and its life expectancy in Europe, thinking about um, the kinds of diets that people have been, um, you know, if we're thinking about access to land, as we came back right back to um, your talk at the beginning, Katicha, thinking about access to land and how that plays out um, in different places across the world, even in Scotland, and access to fresh food and access to actually growing your own food and having, um, having, access to, to life, basically. And I was thinking about Cella Dancy, for example, and people like Rowena Arshad here in Scotland, um, anti-racist campaigners for, for many decades. 
and making me think about the women in Glasgow, also subject to experiments like Dipper Provera, and this happening to working class white women in Glasgow, women in India, and also black communities across the world. Um, also thinking about the many cures and the, the, the knowledge of the long indigenous healthcare systems over hundreds and thousands of years from indigenous people, from enslaved African people that were stolen without credit and often end up in the journals right here in Edinburgh. Um, thinking, for example, of somebody like Alexander Anderson in St. Vincent, who is one of the first people at the Botanical Gardens in St. Vincent, and how he is actually um, commissioned deliberately to go out and to start to extract knowledge from people in St. Vincent, and that knowledge ending up here also in the medical journals. Um, Verse 5, the listening to the sons and daughters of Africa run under midnight's cover. And thinking about people here self-emancipating over the centuries, and thinking about midnight's cover, and thinking about blackness as a blanket of comfort. Thinking about the children here who I speak to who are very touched by the story of Frederick, who was trafficked by the Watt family into Greenock. So thinking about James Watt, the famous inventor, and his whole family. Trafficking this young boy, Frederick, and speaking to children here in Greenock at the age of 10 and 11, and getting them to think. Well, I didn't even have to get them to think about Frederick. This was the point. Their hearts were still open. They still have, had empathy. They still identified with Frederick in that way. Um, I'm working with four-year-olds here, not so much with history, but doing stories that are interactive and stories to do with well-being as a group. I'm being very struck by sitting in a centre of four-year-olds who will not focus on the activity that you've come to do and close that circle of attention until they understand why one of those children might be crying, why that child needs comfort. And... They're not just willing to comfort that child, but they're almost insistent on offering comfort to that child. And when that child feels comforted, that child feels calm, that feel, child feels seen and heard and held and able to come back into the circle, only then are they able to start their activity. And I feel very inspired by those three and four-year-olds in that way. Now, often I work with young teenagers who are very curious about people who would have been their same age, held as supposedly enslaved, or held against their will in areas in the centre of Edinburgh. And we're walking through those spaces, those teenagers also can put themselves, they can extend their own heart and their own empathy to those experiences in some way. We think about sometimes the, the 15 year olds here that we work with who suddenly shut down. And the teachers here amongst you will know that happens get to 14, get to 15. There's often a culture in schools, in Britain I would say, in Scotland and in Edinburgh particularly, you do see a culture where no one wants to be wrong. No one wants to have an answer that somebody else is going to ridicule. Maybe the entire class is going to turn around and ridicule them or abuse them in some kind of way. And they begin that shutting down process, which I think in some cases people never quite recover from. Um, what I hear from students here, particularly black students, Asian students, all students, who, what they need from their curriculum, what they need from their teachers, what they want, what, what isn't there, the kind of care and love that they want their teachers, they need their teachers to have, especially when they're approaching the, these kinds of subjects. Sometimes teachers just haven't thought through the effect that it might have on that one black child in an entirely otherwise white classroom. And I'm trying to very much to work with them to have empathy and imagine that they are that student. How would you want this history to be approached? Are there dignified images of black people in your school? Have you talked about African history at primary school level before you even start to approach this painful history? And working with teachers, I realise that often they 
are struggling, that they want and they need to do better, but they're not sure, they're a little bit lost, and they do need some, some help and direction. Also some self-compassion, to learn how to have self-compassion, and also commitment to doing better. So those two things, I think, go hand in hand. Um, my next verse... And Nadine, you might recognise this, because this was inspired by, by you. Um, thinking about the essence of our hush languages, gathering in the hum of ancestors, shielding us from demons as we walk through graveyards. And I spend a lot of time in graveyards here. There are some graveyards that I can't even go into. There are some graveyards that feel so violent that I don't walk into those spaces, especially alone. Um, and thinking about the language beyond words, thinking about even the gestures, how especially as Caribbean people, we like to move our bodies, Brazilians, I'm sure the same, right? The way that we move, the way we inhabit our feelings, the way that we communicate also with our bodies, even in gestures. They say you tie West Indian hands behind their back, they can't talk, all right? And it's true. But also thinking, linking that to the rates of incarceration of black people in the UK, sometimes because they're just expressing themselves and they've been deemed to be mad, locked up in a high security unit, and looking at those rates that haven't changed or maybe are worse. So I would encourage you, if you don't know about that, to go away and research that for yourself, particularly young black men who are British born, sometimes third generation, who are sometimes locked up for years in high security units. Also thinking about the kinds of emotional repression that can also lead to its own form of madness. As a culture, what do we reward? Rewarding emotional repression sometimes. What does that do to a person? Thinking about the culture of cruelty that developed during the centuries of enslavement and how that still lives with us. Learning to cut off empathy in order to be able to inflict violence, the kind of empathy that those three and four-year-olds still have. But also, not just in order to inflict that violence, but be rewarded for it in so many ways. Soci family level, society level, state level, international level. And looking at that over the centuries, how that has happened on so many occasions. Thinking about graveyards and thinking about Malvina Wells' story coming here from Karakou, being brought here from Karakou as a 12 or 13 year old girl of mixed heritage, African and Scottish, and what her life was like and how many people are touched when we stand in the graveyard next to her gravestone. And again, try to imagine what her life was like. And it's easy to do in some ways because we have a lot more details about her life than we have for so many people who are lost, so many black women particularly, and women of mixed heritage lost we don't know with her we can we can fill in some of those gaps we can fill in that we, should, we know that she was a watercolor painter because there are paintings that still survive we have a portrait of her at the age of 25 with the family we know potentially that her mother's name was Anne and we know that from the oral history of the old people in Karakou and people in Karakou live very very long into over the hundreds 125 126 and so on some of our old people were claimed by COVID just last year and the year before, who were over 100 and lived to 100 and more. Um, so thinking about when we stand in that graveyard, how some people very often who have come from historically affected communities in the Americas often get chills when we talk about people being able to trace their nationhood, their connection, through the drum and through the rhythm. And before DNA testing, the fact that people were able to say, I am Temne, my father is Temne, I am Igbo, my mother is Igbo. And an ethnomusicologist over 30 years going to West Africa and matching the rhythms from Karakou into West and Central Africa. And people get chills because we're standing right there in the graveyard, trying to pay our respects to somebody who's buried there and talk about these connections, but also take joy in the fact that despite everything, 
the connections are beginning to happen again. And people managing to connect through the spirituality, through the music, through the dance, through the food, through the language, and being able to see each other again, um, to be able to see the resemblances of family when the Temne people from um, Sierra Leone go to Karakou and vice versa, and these connections happening again. The last verse, listen to our long range acoustic device. Of course, I was thinking about long range acoustic device and thinking about how sound is being used to harm. And thinking about the Zapatista women who had the honor of taking round from, from Mexico and thinking about how sound is used in their communities for, for harm and for, to inflict damage, to try and force people from those communities. But also how sound can be used to resist and how sound can be used to heal. Coming back to that once more. Um, but thinking about those women who under attack in their own communities but standing up as military warriors to resist in that tradition of indigenous and enslaved African women over centuries. And coming here so that people have knowledge to work in solidarity with them. Thinking about people like the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society, working in solidarity with people like Harriet Tubman, for example. Those kinds of connections over the centuries. Thinking about the black activists who were here on tour and who were part of COP, fighting for, for their lands in places like Louisiana. Thinking about people who are trying to survive in a place like New Orleans at the risk of continual flooding, abandoned after Hurricane Katrina. And even the taxi man in Glasgow, when I was whizzing around Glasgow yesterday, um, very concerned about it and wanting to do something about it. And thinking about how the food riots that happened here, people that were dispossessed here, people that lost their land here, and thinking about Haiti and thinking about Scotland's connection with Haiti. And very often when I do tours, I might talk about the American Revolution, so you probably know about the American Revolution. Yes, we do. You probably know about the French Revolution. Yes, we do. Do you know about the Haitian Revolution? No, nothing at all. And so there's very reason for that. And all of these revolutions are very much connected. And of course, when the American and the French Revolutions begin, they are in favour of enslavement. And without the pressure from the Haitians, maybe the French Revolution would have continued in that vein. Thinking about the children who I used to teach in primary school in Grenada who can tell you all about Scottish military so-called heroes like Sir Ralph Abercrombie. A majority of people here when I take them on tour, they're from Edinburgh, they have no idea about Ralph Abercrombie heading up that huge military mission not just to um, put down wars of resistance right across that region but also to try to reinstate chattel slavery in an island where people have emancipated themselves against the odds and fought off the biggest military, the, the biggest armies in the world at that point. But also thinking about the press gangs, the young men here who were press ganged off and into that mission where 300,000, um, 30,000 British men die. Thinking about the, the resistance that happens in a place like the Isle of Mon, where um, where when a press gang came in and they kidnapped those young, or trying to kidnap those young men to place them onto ships to be part of military missions they did not want to be any part of, they were killed. And when they were killed, the magistrate in the Isle of Man just let them go. He said, I do not want these people coming in and taking our young men to be part of these missions that they want nothing part of either. Taking a word from Bookman's Prayer at the end of that poem. So thinking about Bookman's Prayer and the power of Bookman's Prayer at the beginning of the Haitian Revolution in 1791. Thinking about Haiti being forced to pay reparations from 1825 until 1947. And when people hear about Haiti being forced to pay reparations to France over this long period, the equivalent of 21 billion US dollars today, people are quite shocked. The fact that America gains more in interest every month from Haiti than it gives in aid. And people wonder why they're struggling to live. Who is the God 
who has ears to hear. Asking ourselves, me included, again and again, why are we doing this work? Thank you. Okay. I, I think at the end of this, we can, we can all agree with confidence that, that, that Lisa has made Edinburgh a better place. A place to live, a place to do research. And it doesn't matter what your background is. I think we heard all of that just now in, in her talk. Um, and I, I think more of us scholars, especially, especially the scholars, the ones I'm speaking to, I think we can stand to appreciate that a lot more. So thank you, Lisa. Once more time, one more time. Again, I, I think we're going to continue this conversation. It's going to keep going. So those of you who are who have here with us to Zoom, thank you so much for sticking it out. Thank you to the live audience here as well. And, uh, and once more, thank you to Ben and the IASH um, administration and team. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care, everyone.